Well, thanks everybody for coming along to this. I think basically we, we just want to make it as intimate as, as possible. We've obviously got uh, die-hard borders here. The book is a, a kind of confirmation, really, an affirmation of the virtues and the great work that the Borders has done over the last 130 years, how it's produced 150 rugby players for Scotland, which is almost a sixth of the total, and it's a population, you know, 150,000 down here. So it's, it's punched massively above its weight. So, and these are two of the greatest guys, obviously, who've, who've ever played rugby for Scotland. So I'm going to start talk, letting them talk rather than letting me talk. So anyway, I'll, I'll just start uh, because... We have, obviously, this is, the book has been produced in association with the Bill McLaren Foundation. Just where they're going to ask Gary and John, Gary first, you know, what are your memories of Bill McLaren? <coughs> it's quite boss, this is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I always remember Bill when, uh, when we, we, we made Murrayfield, when we walked onto the pitch, he was always there and he always went across for a chat with Bill and he always had a, pa a packet of hug balls in his pocket. So before every home international, we got a hug ball to suit when we were walking around Murrayfield. And it's just a voice of rugby. He made a, he made a boring game sound pretty good. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, was just, he was so full of knowledge on every player that was on the park. And he, he, he made, a, a, as I say, a boring game sound really good. What about yourself, John? Well, same as Gary. I mean, it, it's amazing how someone could command such respect throughout the world. And... He was there on the pitch as the players walked out before the game. And it wouldn't matter if it was the All Blacks, uh, the Springboks, all their players would come over and salute, salute the ball. And inevitably, they'd get a hoik ball. But <laughs> my, my first memory of Bill goes back to primary school. And um, when the foundation was first started, I, I was asked this question. And they, they used to have a, a primary school sevens competition and I was playing for Philippot Primary. And at that time, Burnfoot, uh, Trinity, uh, is that Drumlanrig? Uh, would have been the strongest uh, schools because Bill had been coaching them all, all the way through. Anyway, we got to the <coughs> final against Burnfoot and we won by a spawny try, I think. And Bill McLaren came over to speak to the Philippot uh, players of course, we, we all knew Bill, and it was just in awe when he came over to say, you know, well done. And my memory was just a huge man standing, uh, speaking and saying well done. And that meant more to us than uh, win, winning the competition. Well, this is it. I mean, I mean uh, even in 1996, when, when Bill was 72, I was over in New Zealand. And obviously this, this man, Mountain Jonah Lomu, had started, uh, you know, playing for, for, for New Zealand. And... And when Bill came, and even at that age, he still wanted to know all the, the, how many caps, what their strengths were, what their favourite club was, the rest of it. It's the age that Jonah Lomo seemed almost more in awe of Bill McLaren than the other way around. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. I'm going to meet Bill McLaren. Yeah. You know, and it was just, this, and this was in New Zealand, this was thousands of miles away, but he just had that kind of the, global that, that impact. You know, when uh, there was rugby special, uh, Bill would if it was Jed or Hoyk or whatever, Bill would be at the training on Tuesday and Thursday night making sure he, he had the names properly, that he knew the brothers' and sisters' names, how many games they'd played, how many points they scored. Now, how, how many uh, commentators in the world would put in that kind of preparation for a club? club match. Yeah. Well, this is it. I mean, he, he just, he made it sound easy because he did so much hard work beforehand. Is that almost, to some extent, what somebody like Jim Telfer, because I'll move on to Jim Telfer here, because the important thing to me is, and I know that Gary's got a lot of good memories of Jim, <laughs> that, that obviously, w was it important maybe that they were both teachers, that there was this d determination to, one, they were passionate about rugby, they loved rugby, but they also were determined to teach and get and get kids right from an early age, get them to to love rugby themselves. I think they were the best out of whoever they were they were coaching or teaching. Mm. That's the type of people they were. They wanted the best from from people, mm. and uh, with the greatest respect for Jim and everyone, he did get respect from everybody, just the way he coached you. And it's the same for for Bill. He he done his homework, and you can see the scripts before every inter international. Mm. The amount of work that man put in was unbelievable. But Jim's exactly the same, and it's just a, it's maybe just a border thing. You mm. like to do things to the best of your ability, 
and that's what Jim and Bill done. I mean, obviously, I mean, John, you were you were involved with the Scotland team that that won the Grand Slam in 1984, and obviously Jim was involved with that. What what what, what were the qualities do you think that he brought to, to that team? He was a great motivator, uh, Neil. That's first and foremost. He uh, he wouldn't say anything unless it meant something. Where I, I want a lot of coaches that just speak for the sake of it, but everything Jim said had a meaning. He, he really prepared you well to, uh, to win. And in these days, it, <clears throat> there wasn't the video analysis that there is now. But Jim would, Jim would do that on his own, and he would look for weaknesses. The final game uh, that we won against France, he told Jim Calder uh, to be aware of knockdowns from that part of the line he, he had spotted a, a, a weakness that France had a tendency to knock it down, and, and Jim uh, was ready for it. And our, but when we played England that year, he, he, had, uh, he had noticed that the two wingers lay really, really flat, Slemon and Carlton, I think it was. I went down to the, the pitch the morning of the game, and we talked about where they would stand, and he wanted me to put the ball b- behind them and with real good chasers, uh, you know, Roger Baird was, he'd, he'd lie up flat. So I don't think Jim got, got um, the credit he deserved as, as not just being a motivator, but being prepared and being tactically very aware. Would you not agree with that, Gary? Yeah. He, he really he, knew he, his stuff. And he wasn't afraid to, to, to get hung up in coat racks either, was he? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was telling the boys just before we come in, the, the first of our visit I had the part of the Prince. I think Ian McGeekin was ill, so Jim had to take over. I always remember all the backs standing on the, on the benches, hanging onto the coat hangers, and, and Jim was winding the forward up like he usually does and gets them all wound up. And uh, He was going about hitting them and smacking them. He says, look at you bees, you'll not even hit me back. Well, Damien Crone at this point lifted them up by the collar, shoved them against the wall. He went, that's better, and he couldn't <laughs> get away because he was hanged on the coat hanger. <laughs> <laughs> He was, he, was, uh, he was a great man. He had, and there was another occasion he had uh, had seats lined out in two lines as if we were on a bus and there was a single seat at the front for the captain. <laughs> and there was nothing better than Jim walking out slaving all over the top of you getting excited <laughs> before a big international. And he would say to us, like, turn your seats and look at the man opposite you. Well, he would see all the shoulders juggling. Up. <laughs> <laughs> you were terrified to laugh because you got a bat in the head. <laughs> One of the obviously with this being in Hoyek, but I mean Hoyek are they did set the benchmark in so many different ways. They won the first Border League, they won the first national championship when it came in, they won the first Scottish Cup. I mean, what was it? I mean, I, I know that Hoyek's a big community, but in Gala Shields is a fairly big community as well, and they've never won anything like as many championships and cups and things. I mean, what was it about Hoyek, do you think, that made them such Hoyek. a, a Hoyek. difficult team? The best team in Britain at one point. Hoyk had the best system in Britain. They, uh, for a small town, you had two semi-junior teams and they went into four junior teams. These four junior teams had two teams and then they all fed in, into the Hoyk team. Now, at that time, I don't know, would there be 16,000 people in Hoyk? I mean, that, that was a system um, that I don't think another town of, of that size in Britain uh, would have, and it's a, a bit like New Zealand, where you get the best players just coming to the top. Now, if you couldn't cut the mustard with the trades of the YM, you, d- you didn't get a crack at the Hoyt team. I, I think at that time, playing for Hoyt was, was probably more important than playing for your country, if you were a Hoyt boy, and I think that's just why they were better than anyone else. Because they obviously they had this, this great kind of succession of coaches I mean, I mean it's one thing perhaps that I've done in the, bo- in the book that one or two people that I spoke to certainly including Colin Deans and Alan Tomes said that they thought that Derek Grant's contribution has perhaps been understated a little bit that perhaps he deserves a little bit more credit as well for that it's all about Jim Telfer and it's all about you know, you know him and, and but that Derek Grant at, at Hoyek was a great figure during that time, and he was also in charge of Scotland as well. Is that your, your own feeling on it? Well, I thought Derek was a great coach because he was uh, he was in the Scottish scene when I first broke through. 
Mm. Uh, he was sort of similar to Jim, but he wasn't maybe as vocal. Mm. Uh, but he studied the games just as much as what Jim done, and he went into the game in detail. And uh, he would he would come out with sort of some of the same stuff that would Jim you would expect to come for Jim. Mm. But he, he just wasn't a, he wasn't as vocal, and he wasn't a, he, can, he was he was steeped in border rugby, mm. and he wanted everybody to do well. I think a point we missed there that a lot of the kids started the rugby at Jed and the mini rugby. So. <laughs> 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 When we look at that, that 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 glorious period, I mean, basically from about 1980 to 1991, probably, I mean, it, it just seems that wherever you looked, I mean, there was almost like a logical progression of people coming on. There was yourself and Roy Laidlaw. There was <coughs> there was Gary and there was Craig Chalmers. Uh, I mean, w- I think that's a desire for, and it's like a stepping stone. You play for your junior clubs. You want to play for your 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 first team. And your next step was to play pulling the red and white of the South. And it was a massive honour to be presented with a South jersey. Uh, and everybody desired to play for there. Um, nowadays, you can, with professionalism coming in, I was lucky I had amateur and professional. Yeah. And with the professional leader coming in, I think the borders has lost a little bit of their, their rugby identity. Whereas when the South was strong, it goes back in history. When the South was strong, the Scottish team was strong. And we're picking all the good players. We're still producing good players in the borders, mm. but they're going away to play for Glasgow and Edinburgh now. I mean, you mentioned a phrase to me last week, Gary, and, I, and I, it's, a str- it's an emotive phrase, but it, you obviously believe it, that to some extent the heart has been ripped out of it. Well, I feel, it's, you can, I, I feel as though it has, because rugby's changed, I know it's changed, but I still think we should have a, a, a borders team in the borders. Uh, and I think the last time the SRU started the Borders team, we done it wrong. Mm. Uh, we brought in a whole load of foreign players and then tried to put them out to the Borders clubs. Mm. Well, it doesn't matter what you say. Borders people are pretty fickle. Mm. If you didn't have a guy from Hoik uh, playing in the Borders team, they'll no go and support them. Or a Jed guy. You can, if we had picked the best of the Borders bunch mm. and, and brought them together as a professional outfit, the boys would have been given the chance to train and get better. And we'd still have had the support. You look at the South game, it was at Gala. There was a massive crowd turned up because it was all border players that was playing in it. And I think that's what we missed the opportunity uh, when we, we reproduced the borders team at Gala to do that. And I think it's a massive uh, void in, 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 in the rugby down here. I mean, did you feel that yourself, John, that the, the South days were so good that that could have been built upon? I, I think they did away with the, t- with the team too quickly. And uh, it's it's all relative. You, you think of the borders. The, the the rugby area has maybe got eight, eighty thousand people. And I think the average gate was three three and a half thousand. And I got fed up listening to how the the papers would write that the crowds in the borders weren't good mm-hmm. enough. And yet you'd look at Glasgow and Edinburgh, and they were the same crowds, but with populations four or five times. Uh, bigger, bigger than the border, so I, I, I never felt that was was uh, relevant. What what the borders needed was investment. Mm-hmm. It, ne- it needed the, the SIU to say we we can put more money into the borders. And I think if we'd got the borders winning, and to me, guy, that's what it's all about. Okay. You, yeah. you get a team winning, people will, will come and support it. But because it was so underinvested. <clears throat> Uh, the, the borders really never never got going. Uh, whereas if we had a winning team, I think you'd have found the crowds would have been up six, six or seven thousand. And when you think that's ten percent of the population of this area, uh, that would be pretty amazing. And I just felt it was, it was under investment at that time and pulling the plug too early. Is there maybe a sense that in Scotland we we maybe have a bit of a negative culture that we? we, we we get down on ourselves a little bit because I mean I'm even just thinking about World Cup campaigns that 20 years ago we reached the semi-final of a World Cup and very nearly won it. I mean Gary, you were you were playing in that game. Yeah. I mean and, and I know a lot's been made about Gavin Hastings, but missing a penalty. But but I mean that was another team that was full of borders pe- team. That was a year after yeah. the 1990 Grand Slam. I mean how how much how memorable is that Grand Slam? Oh, it's a massive thing in your mind. You can. Uh... 
I was lucky to play with a lot of great players, John Jeffrey, Finlay Calder, all these guys, and they were older heads than Craig Chalmers and myself, and, and they were like father figures to us. Uh, there was a lot of sweat away on the Lions Tour in 89, mm. and I think we learned so much on the Lions Tour for other, other players from the, 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 the other nations mm. that when we did come back, we had six or seven playing against England in 1990. But there's nothing more motivating than walking out on the pitch at Murrayfield and seeing... Seeing the English boys getting their photos taken with their wife this memorable day at Murrayfield. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and when uh, when they decided to walk out, that was just even better uh, yeah. because the the noise in Murrayfield that day was electric, right for the f for the first whistle to the last whistle. Mm -hmm. It was just unbelievable, and I think the crowd had a massive part to play in that game. Yeah. Uh, was it that's just the desire to win as well. Was it maybe difficult to replicate that a year later because everybody, the, the teams knew each other so well, perhaps? In the same well, I think there's a massive thing in defence now. They're bringing us this rugby league defence in, and it's all rugby nowadays, it's all about the defence. It's can I don't know how we how we, we go back to being more open running rugby, but I think the well, you can watch the Welsh team in the World Cup, they've got a lot of young kids in there at 21, 22, 20, give them a shot. They're enjoying themselves. They look as though they're enjoying themselves, and uh, they're playing some great rugby. Mm. You can you must admit when England did win the World Cup, they were playing some good rugby, mm -hmm. and they were moving the ball about, and, and then they went back into their shell after they won the World Cup. Yeah, I mean, is, is this a thing that perhaps turns off? I mean, is, is there an element of, of families, or certainly maybe a bit thinking the game is getting more and more physical? The game's getting the bit, tackles are getting he bigger and bigger. Professionalism is making these. The, in, the risk injury, is that maybe putting well, you know, got to look at some the players now in professionalism? They're training every day. They're doing weights. John and I probably never done weights before. Uh, we can, when we played for the South, I can't dodge me, didn't it? <laughs> 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 it wasn't until we went to Newcastle we found out what weights were all about. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, nowadays we're producing, like some of them will be gym monkeys mm. because they'll never make the grade, but they're, they're, they're tremendous trainers. And uh, I found that when I went to professionalism, we get a book like this, and you had to write in the book what you what you were lifting and report mm. into your fitness trainer, and that was when we come back to the borders, and, and that's not what it's all about. Think of the lies, you would, think of the lies you would tell in that book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Well, <laughs> <old burst>. uh, <laughs> I, I just caught the start of professionalism as a coach, <clears throat> and um, used to have to write down what you ate in the morning. You know, your, your diet, and they'd have a, a professional dietitian that would look at it, right? Honestly, Gary, when uh, I first made the team, we used to stay at the Braid Hills Hotel and you used to train on the Thursday morning, and it was a race back at the hotel because the hotel always had cakes and scones in it. <laughs> and you could see the forwards pushing the wee backs out of the way, and there was, honestly, there was a table pile like that. And you can imagine all these dietitians nowadays <laughs> thinking, what is good on you? And also, we, we would go for a beer. On the Friday night before a game, you'd go, there was, uh, was it the Buxton? There's, there's a wee mm. bar behind uh, the hotel. And it was, uh, I, I remember having um, a, a couple of pints with Derek Grant. This is the, the night before the game. And it wasn't serious drinking, but... I don't, it was your mate, you're playing with your mates and you talked about the game and, and uh, the best uh, result I ever had was 12 ball at Twickenham <laughs> it was 4 o'clock on the Thursday morning <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't know, yeah, I, I think there has to be a balance in, in um, professional rugby a lot of the fun in the game has gone when professionalism come in uh, as I said I was lucky I had a, a long time as an amateur and some of the fun we used to get up, it was unbelievable. And some of the pranks in the team, oh. in the hotels, is, they didn't do that now. Oh. It's all, they're too serious and it's rugby, rugby, rugby all the time. I remember touring Australia and, and our um, manager was the guy from Kelso, Arthur Hasty. <laughs> and the boys uh, had sneaked into his room and had put Celestine across the toilet, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he went, he went for a pee, and he, he, you know, he, could, he was in the glasses and like that, and it was going all over the place, right? And these guys are up at the window watching it. Was, <laughs> it was a high flyer in the insurance company, and Brush and me thought we were sneaking early, and we're going into the coach's room. Well, we cut the toes off their socks, <laughs> <laughs> and 
and you cut the bollocks out of their pants. <laughs> We didn't realise that he had to go away to a big uh, banker's meeting <laughs> early from town, so you can imagine him sitting with his bollocks. <laughs> but they've got their own back on a Saturday. <laughs> You've talked about one or two of the things that, are, that have maybe been lost with professionalism, but, I mean, what's your message in terms of that we're now in, the, in 2011, going into 2012 shortly? I mean, what is your message for, for the, the Borders clubs? I mean, what would you do personally to try and you know, reactivate rugby benches. Personally, and this is probably a wee bit controversial, I, I would put the borders into the British and Irish Cup. I, I think there's an opportunity there uh, to pull all, all the players together. You, you're getting pr a pretty good standard of, uh, of matches. It's in, the, it's in the rugby calendar. I think it'd be very well supported. As a South... Uh -huh. But it's very difficult because y you've got all these um, ambitious clubs who are playing in Prem 1 and they're playing to get into that top three to play in that. And you know, I would feel bad about them losing out in that, but I think in terms of border rugby, there is an opportunity there to play meaningful games and to pull all the clubs uh, t together. But I, c I can never see that happening, unfortunately. So... What we're doing at the moment is great. And I know speaking to the Selkirk boys who've been fortunate enough to, to play uh, for that South team, they love it. They absolutely think it's, it's great. And that's why I, I think that there's an opportunity there, but I can't see it happening in the near future. It's going right round in a circle. Like when we were picked for the South, <clears throat> it's just what we said before, you put Borders people into a position like that and they'll try their hardest to please everybody. And that's what you're after. You can only ask the best for somebody. And if they're giving you 100%, you can't ask any more than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, because obviously we've got a Rugby World Cup going on at the moment, which people will have been watching, uh, obviously, over the last sort of three or four weeks. I mean, I feel I have to ask you this. I mean, how, John, how, were you surprised that Scotland didn't get to the quarterfinals? Or? I was disappointed. They were in a tough group. But I, th I, I, I think they'll be disappointed with the result against Argentina. Um, they played well enough to win and at 12-6 with 10 minutes to go you've got, you've got to look to close the game out and we had a very poor kick-off reception and some very poor defence after that I think they'd be disappointed and to give the 7 points away and then we got ourselves in a great position to, to, to win the game and uh, I just, we weren't smart enough. And uh, I, I don't agree 100% with what Dan Parks was saying. He got the ball at the wrong, the wrong time. You know, he, he should have been getting himself slightly deeper to, to, to give himself uh, space. But uh, we could have worked it right under the post. And it's a 95% chance of uh, knocking it over and you're through. And if we beat Argentina, we, we'd, have, we'd have had... Uh, aye. And we, we could have beaten England. We were every bit as, uh, as good as England. So I'm disappointed, more, more than surprised, uh, Neil. And, you know, when you see how well Wales are doing, it'd have been nice to have seen Scotland in a similar position. Because th there's no real reason why Scotland should be any worse than Wales, is there, in terms of, you know, raw talent? Or is there maybe just more talent down there? Well... Remember, they've got four full-time professional teams. We've got two. So right away, they're producing 50% more professional players to, uh, to choose their team from. No, I would say Wales are in a stronger position uh, than us. But I think we've got a, a reasonable crop of players. Uh, we were very competitive. Nobody, nobody gives us a hide in, um, uh, with, the, with the full team out. I think they've got a good coach. Andy Robinson's done a a good job there. We look very well organised and prepared. And they don't have anybody going swimming, do they, during uh, jumping off ferries and things no, like that either? Uh, so it's, uh, I mean, is, is that, is that though, to some extent, does the fact that the, the press these days does home in on these things, is that maybe something that's been lost as well, that it, there seems to be a relentless, nobody's allowed to have fun anymore in rugby? That's because of professionalism. Everybody thinks because of professionalism it's their job. 
Uh, and that, we've touched on it before. There's, there'll not be any uh, fun in the squad. They're thinking rugby all the time and they're away. And I think that's one of the big things we have lost. Uh, even after international, there's no dinners now. They'll have a dinner, but you'll sit at separate tables and you're only there for an hour and they're away. Whereas we, we all mixed up in the years gone past and it's made some great friendships. But uh, going back to the Scottish team, I think the, you can have to focus on your Achilles heel and that's scoring tries. Mm. Uh, if you're not scoring tries, you can't expect to win test matches. Is, uh, is there a problem with it just maybe people don't think on their feet, they don't trust their Well, instincts? I think we've got a tremendous pack of forwards mm. uh, and I think they're fronting up to everybody. Uh, and our backs is trying to go through moves that they do in the training park and they're not playing with their heads up. I think uh, there's an element of playing by numbers. Uh, Dan Parks put a cross fuel kick in and it was a second row stand in the wing. Again, in a training park move, you'd have the winger there. Mm-hmm. And it's just things that you can, they're just no watching what's in front of them mm-hmm. uh, and hitting gaps. Is that maybe where we, to some extent, we are missing the borders? That I mean, you talked earlier about it. Must have given you a hard edge when you, if you spilled a pass, everybody in the town told you the next day or oh, oh, chided you about it. I mean, do we maybe are they in a cocoon maybe these days? When I joined Newcastle, we had a meeting with Rob Andrew, and he wanted to start an academy at, at Newcastle Falcons. And uh, when we were speaking to Rob, he says the best he could do with these young guys, Rob, is. When they come in for their summer, send them away on a building site. Mm-hmm. He's like, what the hell have got to do that for? I says, well, it gives them a, They're working 12 hours and they're getting a wage. Mm-hmm. Bring them back in after the summer on the building site and say, right, do you want to be a builder or do you want to play rugby? Because mm-hmm. a lot of these guys didn't realise how hard it is to make money because they've been given a lot of money from leaving school or university for playing mm-hmm. rugby. And they think it's easy. Mm-hmm. Ken is, whereas in the past, we had to work a 12-hour mm-hmm. shift, train... We got time off on a Wednesday to go and meet up with an international team. Mm-hmm. And it was only the forwards and uh, two half-backs on a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Thursday, Friday, and you played on a Saturday, and you were back working on a Monday. Uh, I think we've lost that. Can boys get money too easy? And we've lost the, the value of the thing. Yeah. I mean, not, not to get onto the too controversial, because obviously <coughs> the, the borders here is, is what we're going to try and... It is a very positive book about the borders, despite one or two of the things I might have said. Uh, and obviously, you've got Melrose, who won the, all the, the titles in the 1990s. You've got Hoyt winning all these titles. I mean, is there any one character or any one person that you, you think of and you think, that's borders rugby? For me, um, if, I, if I think about my own club, there was, there was a guy called Mick Linton. He used to play, play in the wing for us. And Mick was... He was a huge man for a for a winger, and he just made you laugh. And he was tough, and he was really. I mean, I do. Was that Robbie laughing? <laughs> Robbie. I mean, the guy was. He was so. <laughs> I, I remember playing um, Melrose, and this guy Mick Linton got the ball. He was fast without being really fast, and the Melrose winger was chasing after him, not really trying to tackle him. And he got too close to Mick. And Mick, instead of handing him off, grabbed his jersey, right? <laughs> and he's running along, nutting him like this, right? <laughs> and the Melrose guy shouted up, Mick, I'm not even trying to tackle you! <laughs> so, and Gary, you know, just guys at your club like that. Uh, but, I mean, for, for um, the South, I mean, Jim Rennick was a great man. Great fun, great player. Alan Toombs, mm. fantastic uh, player. Just, you know, when you think of the miles Alan Toombs has put in to play for Hoyke, like he, he probably had 12 years playing for Hoyke, lived south of Newcastle, came up three times a week. I mean, mm. inc- incredible commitment. Uh, blokes like that were fantastic. I mean, and, and because another thing we mentioned, obviously, is the number of volunteers that there were, that every club has people. And the clubs wouldn't, they, they wouldn't keep going, would they, without these, the people that, they, they may be not front-taking centre stage, but they're working behind the scenes and they're making sure the next, because it is another thing as well, families in the borders. I mean, I know it's maybe the case with other places in Scotland as well, but you notice generations of laid laws and obviously, and obviously it, every club has them. You know, of, of families bringing through 
their sons played, th their wife would be involved with the committee. They're, they're, they're just generation after generation. Is that something? That, that's something precious as well, isn't it, Gary? Definitely so. You can. Uh, always one of my memories is going to uh, get your tea. There was always great banter with the tea yeah. women, and they were always involved with the committees of the club, and uh, they were stalwarts of your club. And if these boys had they had the insight into doing that and, and coaching little kids, mm. can they produce some great players for Jed coming through? And it's still going on yet. Can these things you have to look at them and, and say, well, that was that was great insight, and the, the whole whole of Scotland's doing it now. Mm. Uh, and going back to the tea ladies, some of the banter used to get with Daisy doing it, Jed there, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody knew them. Because they got some, if they beat Jed, <laughs> I think what they're done with their tea. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's all these characters in the clubs that you have to remember, and I think we've lost that a wee bit, and if we get them back, it would be tremendous. In general, I mean, rugby in the borders, I mean, there's, there's been a, you, you've, you had, you know, the great Hoyek team, and then you had Gallo in the championship, then you had Melrose winning six and seven years. I mean, what would your, your your own personal message be in terms of to, to kids and to everybody else in terms of what can the rest of Scotland do that the Borders has done in the future? I think produce your own players. Uh, I think we've we've all we're all members of clubs, and I, I think it's very important that you you look at your own system, your process, how how you take a kid from mini rugby. Uh, through school, through semi-junior rugby, uh, so that when they play for Jed or, or, or Selkirk, they're, um, they're well prepared for, for uh, senior rugby. And I think border clubs do that better than other clubs. I, I, I think when you, when you look, at, um, look at the Jed team at the moment are very yeah. good. You know, there's, there's a chance they could go up to Prem 1 next year. You look at the Jed team, probably 12, 13 of these boys came through their mini rugby, uh, Jed Thistle, and I think that's tremendous credit uh, it's family to, oriented. to Jed. Mm. But if you look at your <coughs> Hawks and your Curries, Neil, and I mean, I'm not, I don't want you to be too critical because they're good teams and uh, they're very strong, but they don't produce their own players. Mm. No, they're a, an amalgamation of players that they bring, uh, bring in. And I, th I think I would like to think the borders will all will always do that, and we're, s we're still doing it at the moment. Mm. I think the borders is producing some tremendous young kids mm. coming through. Again, looking at the Jed Club, you've got the young brothers there in the mm. Scottish Seven squad. You look at other teams in the borders; mm. they're still producing players. Again, the border clubs and st they're still producing the quality player. Mm. Uh, and as Rudd says, producing your own is the best way to go. Yeah. Uh, because you get your, your the the boy playing in the team, and you get his mum and dad coming in, his granny coming in, yeah. and it boosts everything. So basically, so, so the message really is that the Borders Rugby is still it's still a vibrant part of of, yeah, of so. life down here yeah. in a way that perhaps it isn't in other parts. I mean, is it important to maybe try and get the, the inter district championship back, or is that something that's just gone? There need to be less fixtures. I mean, I can't remember what happened in the. 80s, but it, or, the, or, the, or the 70s, you, you used to play club rugby, and then it was like a progression. You, you moved in, and then you played for the South, and you played Glasgow, uh, Edinburgh, Northern Midlands. The, the exiles were in them, and these were really hard games. I mean, they were, they were uh, international matches because, oh, yeah, yeah. and then you had the trial <laughs> match. And then, so you had to perform in all these games, and then you had to perform in the trial before you got picked. And it, it just seemed a good, a good way of picking, way through, uh, picking the team. But of course, we're in a different era. You've got amateur rugby, and you've got professional yeah. rugby. I wonder if I could maybe ask you to uh, put your hands together for two of the genuine legends of Scottish rugby.